as I was saying, we're in our series, week number three, well, week number four, uh, third gospel of the four gospels that we're looking at these four perspectives. If you've missed that, they're all online. Go get them, okay? You, you can't have a series on four perspectives on one Savior and only get three perspectives, okay? So if you've missed one, you've missed out. Make sure you fill in the gaps. They're all online. But four different authors, if you look at these four different authors, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, each of them are writing to a different audience, right? So, so Matthew writes to the Jews, Mark writes to the Gentiles, Luke writes to humanity, and then John writes to the church, right? So each of these four are writing their gospel, they're writing their message to a different section or a different audience. And today we're going to look at Luke's gospel. Last week we looked at John's gospel that was written to the church, and this week we're looking at Luke's gospel, and he's writing to humanity, and we're going to jump straight into it as I speak today on the topic, Jesus for humans, okay? So if I had to title Luke's gospel, I would call it Jesus for humans, okay? This is Jesus for humans, accessible for humans, okay? So uh, yes, for dummies, like Jesus for dummies, I just didn't want to say dummies, honey. You're giving it away, okay? So you, we don't, we're not allowed to call people dummies, okay? We don't break down. We build up, remember? Okay. So there we go. So, so Luke chapter 1 of verse 1, this is how Luke kicks off his, uh, his gospel. He says, Inasmuch as many have taken it in hand to set in order a narrative of those things which have been fulfilled amongst us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding, okay, a lot of humility in the statement, okay, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write to you an orderly account, most excellent Theophilus. Okay, now this is fascinating. Luke is the only gospel author that addresses his gospel not at a crowd, but he addresses it at an individual, Theopolis. Now, Theopolis is basically the, the combination of two Greek words, theos and, and philis, which basically says friend of God or God's friend. You can read it both way around. But, but what's fascinating about this is that he's writing this gospel to the friend of God or to God's friends all around the world. And, and so if you go and read different commentaries on the gospel of Luke, you'll see that some will say, well, it wasn't a real guy named the Theophilus. It's actually just friends of God everywhere, and others would say, no, 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 it was definitely a real guy, and, and here you can see him in church history, and you can pick up on him, and the whole thing, and I just read this, and I, I realized that doesn't matter. How amazing is it that in this person's name, whether God made sure that there was a person named Theopolis that Luke was writing to, or whether Luke was writing to each and every one of us as friends of God, both those things are pretty cool because Luke starts off his gospel and he says, this Jesus came because you are a friend of God. So let me tell you about it. Okay, so who's Luke? Who's the author of the gospel of Luke? Um, he was definitely a Greek individual. We know that from the language that he uses. So if you look at the actual Greek words he uses, it's the hardest Greek of all the Gospels, by the way. So, so if you read the Gospels in Greek, Luke's the hardest. He uses high and lofty, difficult Greek words. That's Greek to me. Um, it's probably Greek to you too. But, but that's his Gospel. It's clear that he was definitely with the disciples and likely an eyewitness himself. But what's interesting about him is that Luke actually writes his Gospel as he hears from Paul. So do you guys remember when we, when we spoke a little bit about the different Gospels and we said the very last one we're going to do is Mark. We're doing that next week. And you'll see that Mark actually didn't write on his own accord, but he was writing according to what he heard from one of the other apostles. And you'll hear more about that next week. But this week, when Luke writes, he's actually writing what he's hearing from Paul. So you can in some way say that this is Paul's or likely highly influenced by Paul, his gospel version. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 11, he speaks about only Luke is with me, right? So he's saying that Luke was with him, he wrote with him. But then Colossians 4, 14 tells us something very significant about Luke. It says this about Luke. It says, Luke, the beloved physician. Okay, so Luke writes a gospel to human beings 
beings as a doctor, okay? So our beloved physician and his family, we have several beloved physicians, but we know that one of our beloved physicians um, has COVID at the moment, and know we're praying for you guys. It was so good seeing you guys today, but we have some beloved physicians, and I'll tell you what, when you spend time with a physician, and that's true of all the physicians in 512, is that every single one of them, you'll know one thing about it, and that is that they love people. They don't get into that job for any other reason. They get into that job because they love people and they understand people. And when, when Luke's writing, he's writing a gospel to people, to human beings. He's aware of our biology. He's aware of our frailty. He's aware of our difficulty. He understands the fact that we're humans. And he's writing his gospel to humans about what Jesus came to say to humans. That was the whole idea. So when you read the gospel of Luke, there's this sentence, okay? It's, he says, son of man. He calls Jesus the son of man. And he doesn't do it once. He doesn't do it twice. He does it 26 times in the gospel of Luke. He says, son of man, son of man, son of man. Interestingly, this statement about Jesus isn't made in many of the other gospels, but Luke uses it 26 times because he's trying to tell us, he's trying to teach us something. He says, Jesus was the son of man. Now, I don't know about you, but when I read this, it, it bugs me a little bit. It feels wrong to call Jesus the son of a man. It doesn't feel God enough. Okay, is that just me? I mean, it, it kind of feels like son of man, son of man. It's, it's so familiar. It's so every day. I mean, I, when you read the Gospel of John, it's son of God. Now that I go, yeah, Jesus is God. I get that. But son of man almost feels a little derogatory. It almost feels a little too low for Jesus. And this is the struggle we have, the, the struggle of understanding Jesus for who he is. And I, maybe it was just my children's Bibles. Anybody had some children's Bibles? Did you, did you read them growing up? Okay, I, I know some of you did, right? Okay, so when you read these children's Bibles, the, the, the children's Bibles had pictures of Jesus in them, right? Now, I... I those pictures, I, I was looking for some to bring you today, but I couldn't get it over my heart because it is, it is so varied. You find everything from him having a halo while he was on earth to him having perfectly blow-dried hair. I always was fascinated by the perfectly blow-dried hair. And I just wish I could find where Jesus came up with a blow-dryer. I mean, where did, where, where, where's that verse where he created the blow dryer and that's why we can blow dry our hair because in my children's Bible, I mean, he had these long wavy curls that was like, you know, it's like Jesus, the supermodel. You know, it's, it's, that, that's what he looked like in my children's Bible. And did you notice how white his robe was? I mean, there was no dirt in his life, okay? He, it was like, I don't know if it was tired, but it was, it was something, okay? So this is what we've established theologically today. Jesus invented tide and the blow dryer, okay? Good, we're making progress. But, but, but here's the thing, is we struggle with Jesus because we see Jesus in a certain way and we struggle with his humanity. I struggle with his humanity. I struggle with understanding Jesus as a human being. And it seems like when Luke is writing his gospel, it's like he wants to make this point. Jesus was human. Now, the early church for hundreds of years, and I can't get into this, would, would struggle with that. In fact, um, in the late third century, uh, sorry, in the, uh, yeah, in the late second century, actually, in the late second century, you, you'll have the, the, the Docetai arise, which is basically a sect of Christianity called Docetism. And, and they basically come up with this idea. They say Jesus was this phantasmal being. There wasn't a real Jesus. It was just God made it appear like Jesus was on earth because God is too big and too good to be bound by the bounds of this earth. Now, we know that's not true. And, and then what happens is a guy named Arian kind of arises in the early third century and, and he starts the Arian controversy and there's a whole council about it and a, a whole conversation about it. But basically when he comes and he says, well, when God created Jesus, Jesus was a creature or a creation of God. So he takes it the whole, the one goes and says, no, he's a phantasmal being. God just made it appear like there was a Jesus, but there was no Jesus. The other guy comes and he says, no, no, no. Jesus was a creature. God the Father is God the Father, and Jesus was the creature. He wasn't, he, he was a creation of God. And so he almost overemphasizes that. And it's like this battle is going on between 
How could God, Jesus be God and be human at the same time? And that's exactly what Luke is addressing. He's saying Jesus, God, that came in human form was fully human, although he was fully God. And that's the point he's trying to make. Jesus wasn't any less God because he was human, and he wasn't any less human because he was God. And if you read the Gospel of Luke, you'll see him repeat that again and again and again. And as we read last week around Jesus being the Son of God, as John was trying to make us aware of his deity or his godness, Luke comes and he makes us aware of his humanness. But his godness and his humanness both have comfortable and uncomfortable truths attached to it, right? So if you look at the fact that Jesus being God or being fully God and Jesus being fully human, both of these have comfortable and uncomfortable facts, okay? So here's the comfortable truths, okay? The fact that Jesus is fully God, the comfortable truth is that he's big, he's huge, he's bigger than anything that you face, He's greater than your problems. What do we sing today? He's holy. Amy, that's what we sang, right? He's holy. He's beyond. He's above. He's other, okay? We're proclaiming it. It's a comfortable truth. It's easy to worship one that is bigger than you. There's another comfortable truth in his humanity. The comfortable truth in his humanity is he's relatable. You can come to Jesus. He loves you. He had arms. He could hug. He could love on. You could touch him. You could have a meal with him. You could relate with him. He went through difficulties just like you. That's the comfortable truth, okay? I think it's better that we stop there. Thank you very much for coming to Fileshouse City Church today. It was great having you here. The problem is we humans, we love the root of least resistance, don't we? Only me. No. Yes, we do. Okay. We love the root of least resistance. Because we love the root of least resistance, we miss out on the uncomfortable truths. But they are equally true. And I want to challenge you in this season, in this season where you feel spent and tired and all your energy is just going into surviving, can I challenge you today to embrace some uncomfortable truth? Here's the uncomfortable truth about, firstly, the godness or the God, Jesus being fully God. The uncomfortable truth is that Jesus was supernatural. Jesus wasn't just natural. So if you, if you read through the stories of Jesus, you're going to find some things in there that are challenging, that you can't explain away, you can't You can't figure it all out. You can't just make it happen. But when you think about Jesus, you're going to discover that he's beyond what you're capable of. Why is that uncomfortable? Well, I want to tell you it's uncomfortable because I don't understand everything he did. I don't know why he had to spit in the ground to heal the one guy's ears and had to speak, sorry, eyes and had to, had to speak to the other guy, and the other guy had to do this, and the other guy had to do that. It was different. I, don't know. I can't logically explain it all, but I'm challenged by the fact that he did those things. I'm challenged by the fact that him being fully human lived a life that wasn't just human. And if you don't allow that to challenge you, you're going to settle for a life which is far less than what God has in mind for you. The second uncomfortable truth deals with the humanity of Jesus. And what what this says is it says that he's not the example for us, but he's the example of us. If you missed last week, you want to take a moment and you want to go and listen to the message and particularly the part about John 14, 12, right? If any one of you believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. It's uncomfortable to think that when I look at Jesus, Jesus is the example of humanity. It's uncomfortable because I'm not there yet. Now, if it's a comfortable truth for you, could you please come lay hands on me and pray for me for impartation? It's uncomfortable because it challenges me. It challenges me to live a greater life. It challenges me to trust God for more. It challenges me to, to allow God to come and do more in and through me. Luke makes the point that Jesus is for humans. Jesus is for humans to see who God is and to live in the way that we're supposed to live as human beings. Jesus displays that. 
So one of the places where you see Luke make this point better probably than anywhere else is um, with his genealogy, right? So, so if you don't know what a genealogy is in Luke chapter 3, you'll find one of the two genealogies of Jesus. Uh, the genealogies are the parts you miss, right? One is in Luke chapter 3, and the other one is in Matthew chapter 1. So Matthew and Luke both write genealogies of Jesus. Luke chapter 1, Matthew, uh, sorry, Matthew chapter 1 and Luke chapter 3 gives us these two genealogies. Now, we skip the genealogies because it's this begot that begot this or son of this, son of that, son of the other, right? And we skip it because it's boring. But here's the thing, okay? Some atheists don't skip Luke chapter 3 and Matthew chapter 1 because they love to bring it up because these two genealogies of Jesus differ. They differ vastly. It's two different genealogies. So people come and say, you're telling me four perspectives, one savior? You have no idea what you're talking about because your, your own genealogies, your different perspectives, they differ. So clearly this is a hoax. It doesn't point to a real Jesus. It's all wrong. Once again, great place to end the service right there um, and move on. But, but here's the thing. If you go read these two genealogies, you'll find that they differ, but there's clues in them to why they differ because they actually portray two different genealogies because there's two different ways to look at the birth of Jesus. And I'll show you real quick, okay? So here's Matthew's genealogy. I'm not gonna read all the begots, okay? I promise. I'll, I'll, I'll just read some of the begots. But verse one, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham, Abraham begot Isaac, Isaac, Jacob, Jacob, Judah, and his brothers, so forth, so on. Keep reading, keep going. Verse 15, Eliud begot Eleazar, Eleazar begot Nathan, Nathan begot Jacob, and Jacob begot Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations, and from David to the captivity in Babylon are 14 generations, and from the captivity in Babylon until the Christ are 14 generations, okay? Here's the key thing. He's writing the genealogy. This is the legal genealogy of Jesus. He, who's Matthew writing to? Who can remember? Matthew is writing to the Jews, okay? The Jews know these guys. This is his legal statement that Jesus was the son, the Messiah was come, gonna come out of the generations of Abraham from the line of David. And then he speaks about the, the, the whole exile in Babylon, which was the biggest deal in their journey where the most prophecies about the Christ came. So basically what he's saying is, legally, this is how it works. And verse 16, it says, and begot Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus Christ. So he doesn't say that he's trying to give the physical genealogy of Jesus. He's saying, this is the legal genealogy of Jesus. Comes Luke's reference of Jesus, and we find this in Luke chapter 3, verse 23, okay? We go, and now Jesus himself began his ministry about 30 years of age, being as some, as was supposed, the son of Joseph, the son of Heli, the son of Methat, the son of Levi, the son of Malchi, the son of Jana, the son of Joseph. Do you want to hear me mispronounce some more names? Okay, we'll stop there. Um, but, but he's the son of the son of the son of the son of the son of, but it's interesting, it says, as was supposed. So what he's doing is he's immediately putting this word, the Greek word there is namizo, and basically namizo means as people would say. So he's making it clear that he's not saying, but note that he's not saying the father begot the son, he's saying he, the son of, so he turns it around and he keeps going and going and going and going, and right towards the end of his genealogy, in verse 38, he says the son of Enosh, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the Son of God. And what Luke does when he writes the genealogy is he writes the genealogy of Mary all the way back. Because remember, when Jesus was born, his legal genealogy was of Joseph because he was Joseph's son legally, but his physical genealogy was that of Mary. And when he writes this genealogy in Luke, he, he does, he's not interested in the legal genealogy like Matthew. He's interested in physically who was, whose DNA was in Jesus. And he traces back the DNA of Jesus, not to Abraham, not to his legal father. He traces back the DNA of Jesus to Adam. And he says, son of Adam, son of God. 
So he says when Jesus was born, and, and you've just got to humor me a little, okay? Can I nerd out a little bit for just a second? Okay, this is uh, me nerding out, okay? So just think of the DNA of Jesus. When Luke writes his gospel, he says, okay, remember, Jesus was conceived from God and Mary, right? So he was fully God and fully Mary, just like my sons are fully me and fully their mom, right? Believe me, okay? There are moments where you can see that they're fully their mom, and then there's some unfortunate moments where you can see they're fully their dad. It happens, okay? But, but, but the fact is, if you trace the genealogy, then, then Jesus was the son of God directly. But Luke says, guys, don't miss the point. If you trace his genealogy through Mary, you'll see that Mary goes and father of, son of, daughter of, so forth, so forth, son of Adam, son of God. So Jesus was God from Adam and God from God, and he was fully God because he was God from both. And can I tell you that you and Jesus have one ancestor in common, and that is true of every person on the planet, and his name is Adam, son of God, which means your genealogy can be traced back all the way back to Adam, son of God. God. So when Luke's writing his gospel to human beings, he wants to remind human beings at the get-go and say, hey, guys, remember that we are of the God kind. Yes, we messed it up. Yes, we made mistakes. Yes, sin entered the world. Yes, all of this happened. But before God lost you in Adam, he found you in God. He found you in Christ. He had you in mind when he made Adam and he was always going to save you. He's for all of humanity. That is what he is about. And I wish we had time to read through the entire gospel of Luke today. Because if we would, you would find this theme. You would find Luke taking any conversation and pulling it back to our humanity, our identity in Christ over and over and over and over again. And I'll give you a couple of examples. I don't have time to dig into them too much. But the first was, one is in Luke 20, 25, okay? So Luke 20, what, what's happening is they're coming to Jesus and they're asking him about money, okay? And this is where some of you shut off, switch the stream off. He's gonna talk about money, honey, quick. Internet interruption, okay? Um, but, but here's the thing. So, so they come to Jesus about money because the Jews were double taxed. They were paying taxes to the Romans. We spoke about this in the Matthew um, sermon. But they were also paying taxes to the church. And, and if you were a Jew, you were double taxed to anybody else because you gave a tithe to God and then you, you, gave, you, know, you gave the money to the Roman government. And so they're asking Jesus, hoping he would say, you're off the hook, okay? You don't have to pay the Romans, just pay God. And they ask him this question in Luke chapter 20, verse 20. They say, is it fair for us to pay taxes to God and to Caesar? And Jesus asks them for a coin. Go read the story. And they, they give him a coin. And Jesus looks at the coin and he asks them back. He says, whose face is on the coin? And they say, well, when you look at the coin, the face on the coin is the Roman emperor. Caesar's face is on the coin. And then Jesus makes the statement, Luke 20, verse 25, and he said to them, render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. Right, so now when you read that, you, it'll be interpreted in a couple of ways. And I'm sure you've heard of some people share this message and say, here's the thing, guys, you need to pay your tithes because Jesus says, give to Caesar what is Caesar and to God what is God's. Has anybody heard a message where they said that this is Jesus implementing tithing as a principle in the church? Okay, just me. I've heard it many times, okay? I've heard this one preached. I'm not gonna say anything about them, but I'll tell you what I think Luke was saying, yeah? Is he was saying, when you look at a coin, there's an image on the coin. The image on the coin is the image of Caesar. Why? Because Caesar is the image of the coin. When you look at yourself, there's an image on you. Because God, you are made in the image of God. Remember, this is Luke. He just said, son of Adam, son of God. God's image is on your life. So this, this verse isn't Jesus saying, pay your tithes. Not that that's a bad thing by any stretch of the imagination. But this verse is Jesus saying, hey, remember who you are. Why are you so upset about money? What's money? 
That you are of the God kind. Don't live a subpar humanity. God has called you to live an amazing life. Live it, okay? Luke chapter 15, we find the same thing, okay? So Luke tells three stories. You know the stories, lost coin, lost son, and, and the lost sheep. But he, he, he's basically telling the same story. So he's the only one that dis- displays these stories so well. But he says tax collectors and sinners came on to him, and the Pharisees and the scribes are upset. You guys remember we read this a couple of weeks ago in the Good Father series? Here's the point Luke is making. He's saying, guys, God is looking for you. He's ready to receive you. He's after you. He's looking for all of mankind. And however broken or bruised your life is, he is seeking after you. And maybe you need to hear that today. I I was preparing for this message and I felt God impress upon my heart that there was somebody in the congregation and and I don't know who this is, but I'm gonna share it with you. And if that's you, just just, I'd love to pray with you. But I felt like there was somebody that was, that was settling for a subpar life. You've tried to live the call of God. You've tried to do more. You've tried to step out. You've tried to serve. And every time you've tried, it just hasn't worked out as you'd hoped. And I, I feel like you've recently, it wasn't a, a vow. It was just an internal, you know what, I give up. I'm just going to live this mediocre life and, and, and make it through. And I just feel like God wants to come and challenge you to not give up on what He's placed in your heart. He has not given up on that dream he's placed in your heart. Don't you dare, because it's hard, give up on it. He can bring you through. He can get you to it. I think the the last thing that I'll point out in the Gospel of Luke, that when you read the Gospel of Luke, Jesus is real. He, you, you won't read in any other gospel how many times people are touched, how many times people are healed, how many times people are cared for, how many times he looks out for, he hugs, he, he, he cries for, he weeps over, he stands with, he eats with. It's over and over and over again. In fact, there's one point in Luke chapter 7, verse 33 to 34, where it says, then jo- jo- when John the Baptist came, neither eating nor drinking wine, you said, he is, a, he is a demon. The Son of Man has come eating and drinking, and you say, look, a glutton and a wine bubber, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. It's so clear in the Gospel of Luke that he's, he's just trying to show us that Jesus was real. Jesus was a real human being. And I know, I'm sure you like me have listened to pastors speak and thought, well, you don't know what real life is like. I know you think that. You know, because on Facebook, I'm always on vacation, <laughs> right? And, and my kids are always well behaved and there's, there's always groceries in our house and we never fight ever about anything. And we just, you know, we love doing laundry. I mean, we, we live for this stuff, man. It's fantastic. Why? Because we're a, we're a pastor's house. Everything is beautiful. My hair is always blow-dried. <laughs> Used to be. Life's real. And Luke's coming and he's saying, you know what? Jesus was real. He faced real challenges. He had real difficulty, and yet he was Jesus. And that's exactly what the writer to the Hebrews would write in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15. When he, when he writes about Jesus, and he, and he writes about him being the high priest, and this is what he says. He says, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. Jesus was tempted. He was rejected. He was persecuted. He was tired. He was misunderstood. He was misrepresented. He was physically assaulted. He was belittled. He was broken and he was bruised and he was unfairly killed. Jesus understands what it means when this is a broken world that breaks people. Jesus experienced it. He saw it. He was He was taken aback. He was discouraged at times. He was disappointed by his friends. He lived a real life in a human form. And Luke's whole point with his gospel is just to remind us, to tell us that Jesus was real, and he's so real, and he's 
so ready to come and touch you where you're at. So if you are disappointed, discouraged, experience this loyalty, if you are finding yourself being betrayed or finding yourself in a place where you're experiencing hardship, the whole point of the Gospel of Luke is saying that Jesus came for someone like you. Because you are a son of Adam, son of God. And Jesus came to restore you to your rightful place. And I love how the, how the author of Hebrews continues. And he says, so Jesus was tested in all ways. And then he says this in verse six, 16. He says, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we might obtain mercy and find grace and help in time of need. And can I just point something out here? In this verse, you find both uncomfortable truths about Jesus. Because he says you will find mercy, okay? You will find mercy, you'll find forgiveness, you'll find that grace that comes from the, the divinity of God, his ability to forgive, but also that your humanity will be restored, but also, and at the same time, you will find grace, godly empowerment and enablement to do what God has called you to do. And that is my prayer for you today. May you see Jesus afresh, and may seeing Jesus cause you to trust God that he can deal with your infirmities where you need mercy. Have you ever just said, mercy, please? And I was in a situation this week with a difficult thing and people kept on promising this and that. We're, we were in the process of closing on a house and let's just say everything, everything wasn't blow dried in the process, okay? <laughs> it didn't just fall into place because I served Jesus. And I remember at some point, I just cried out to God. I said, God, have mercy. Have mercy on me. This is so hard. It's okay to ask for mercy because there's mercy with him. He's human, but there is also grace with him. He is God. And he is able to empower and enable you and pour creativity and hope and fullness and life into you like you've never seen before. Lord, may we today, as we come together, Lord, even in the pressing, even in the hardships, even in the difficulty, Lord, when we struggle, Lord, when we go through difficult times, Lord, may we, may we come to you, may we approach the throne of grace with great boldness, with great anticipation, with great expectation, God, that there is mercy, mercy for every person on Facebook, mercy for every person on YouTube, mercy for every person in the room, and mercy for every person on Zoom. Lord, there is mercy in your situation. Not only is there mercy, but there is grace, divine, godly empowerment to not only survive, but to thrive in the midst of what we're going through. God, may we through Holy Spirit be endowed with a creativity and a hope that is out of this world because Jesus is God. But Jesus was also fully human. And may we be fully human. Sons of Adam. Sons of God.